Okay, so in this section, I want to talk specifically about the London riots of 2011, and I'm going to um, do a little historical analysis of um, the way that um, social upheaval has happened in Britain in the past. Um, talk about the, what happened in the London riots specifically, and then give some examples of some of the sociological analysis of what happened. Um, so there's certainly been, you know, like most countries have forms of social upheaval, um, and riots have been a reoccurring um, feature of English life over the past few centuries. Um, you, you know, in the uh, in the subculture lectures in Soccer 1010, you would have seen some of the stuff around the time where punk was happening and the social upheaval that was happening in the late 70s um, in Britain when, you know, the rise of a conservative government, huge unemployment, um, there was, you know, garbage strikes and all this kind of stuff. So it was in, also increased racial tension. And there was um, quite a few examples of... Um, yeah, social upheaval and riots in on the streets of London in particular, um, and this um, what 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 I want to kind of propose throughout the rest of this lecture is that riots are often um, positioned as being these spontaneous things that just seem to happen out of nowhere. Um, the sociological understanding of that, you know, thinking about the flashpoint model already, but you know, thinking more broadly in sociological terms about the um, the various social and cultural ingredients, um, particularly when um, there's kind of in lots of inequality, um, challenges the very idea, very idea that these things are spontane spont spontaneous, um, and they can be then kind of positioned as a as a political um, form of um, rebellion um, and subversion um, and dissent. So here, the kind of, which, in a way, here trying to make the normal look strange here, not kind of just kind of, I suppose, positioning the notion of riots and looting as violence and crime, which, according to our our law system, it is. Um, but maybe thinking more broadly beyond the law. Remember, kind of the Marxist analysis of the law: property is nine tenths of the law. The, the the argument there is law is there to protect those who have property, and therefore the ruling class. Um, here, the um, notion of rights becomes an expression of, of kind of disenfranchisement and alienation and exploitation. So the English riots happened in 2011. There was four nights, you know, huge disorder, um, an estimated $200 million of property damage. There was three, over 3,000 arrests, about 1,000 people were charged, five people died. Um, the, the, um, the riots, most of the dissent happened in the poorest neighbourhoods, so it happened in London, Birmingham, Bristol, and Manchester. But where it happened, you know, within those places, was in the kind of poorest suburbs, um, and it was sparked by the shooting of a of young Mark Duggan. So again, you can see a flashpoint here. There was a particular event, a confrontation between, um, you know, a disadvantaged person who was part of a disadvantaged group um, with the police. This sees as a flashpoint. You know, very similar to, in some ways, to the Rodney King um, LA riots um, when um, the police were found not guilty of the um, bashing of Rodney King back in the uh, early 90s. So in terms of the social, sociological analysis of, the, analysis of this, um, you know, I, without, through, throughout the four weeks I've been talking a lot about how the media tends to um, portray, you know, youth-related things um, sensationally and distorted and tends to scapegoat them and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's one instance here that I would say that isn't, doesn't quite fit that model and The Guardian combined with the London School of Economics to do um, an analysis of what happened and it became known as Reading the Rights. Um, there's a link there uh, to be able to find the report and also to go to the website to have a look at some of the stories there. And so you could argue in many ways that this is kind of a, a rare instance of public sociology. Um, here you can see the, the combination of, um, you know, a social science institute and a media outlet. Now I will say that much of the analysis there is much better than what you would normally get in mainstream media, although some of it does, you know, tend to re um, repeat those kind of key moral panic tropes as well. But as far as it goes, um, there's some really useful analysis there. Um, what the this um, research and analysis found, you know, by doing interviews with those affected by the rights. Um, that there was some key factors. There was opportunism going on here that, you know, people saw there was upheaval going on and found it, you know, a kind of 
convenient time to go and steal some stuff. Um, but really there was a real frustration going on here about social injustices, um, deepening inequalities, um, entrenched unemployment. What many of the people that participated in the rights saw was this deprived existence that they seemed to force to have and that politicians in, and um, the law in particular seems to be built to reinscribe and to, um, to reproduce. So um, if you're interested in some kind of some um, media level writing about this, that is, there's some good stuff there to go and have a look at. In terms of the contemporary understanding of rights, so the, as I said, the flashpoint model is very useful for thinking about this. In terms of the much more contemporary, um, there's, there seems to be a kind of um, an affordance through the use of social media and technology to help organise what happens in um, rights and in protests and social upheavals. Now, I don't want to conflate protests and rights. They are two different things. Um, and much of the um, stuff that was happening in what's been come to known as the Arab Spring, you would kind of see as more in terms of protests, in terms of the definition. Um, and there's a lot of excellent research around those kind of Arab Spring protests and how things like Facebook, Twitter, uh, and the like we use to organise those protests and how they are also used by those um, in power to try and stop them. Um, so there's that, and, but riots are, tend to be more kind of um, what seem spontaneous things and not kind of an organised thing where people gather in a particular place to hold placards or to do things like that. They're much more kind of what seems to be spontaneous at first, but the sociological argument is that that spontaneity is actually an expression of long-held um, inequalities and alienation. So what, what is, does seem to be the case though, that technology seems to speed up the way that these things happen. Um, they kind of, in many respects, go viral, both digitally, but go viral in the sense that people in the local area find out about what's going on really quickly and can, you know, get out of the house and get involved in what's going on very quickly as well. Certainly much of the recent research shows that there's this huge ex these things happen as a huge expression of discontent. And some of the more novel understandings of this point that, that, that much of what seems to go on here seems to be expressed through a form of almost like uh, criminal consumerism. That the riots tend to often now end up in looting um, where you know um, they happen on high streets in, in particular, um, main streets in shopping centers where the people go and they just kind of smash windows and, and take goods. Now, particularly what happens is there's often a, um, often a looting of branded goods. So, you know, you know, athletic branded shoes, mobile phones, iPads, computer equipment, um, stuff like that. Um, but what also bears out in the research too is what happens here in these, you know, very poor areas is that people take the opportunity to go and loot uh, everyday material. You know, they'll go and steal a couple of trolley loads of nappies or baby food and stuff like that. So it's, it's an interesting way to think about what that means in terms of um, consumer society that we looked at in some um, depth in Soccer 101 or in particular in the week on consumerism. So for instance, Zizek talks about how what happens here is this kind of systemic violence of a system that, um, you know, by the very way that it works, marginalises people and pushes them out of the very possibility of participating in society legitimately. You know, the very rise of precarity and things like that that have come increasingly normalised. Um, this becomes expressed in what is it called the violent consumerism. Sigmund Bauman, also a very prominent um, sociologist, also wrote about at the time that these riots were the expression of people that were kind of categorised in a status system as defective and disqualified consumers. Um, in a really important study, I think, that kind of bears some of this out in some actual sociological empirical work rather than just kind of theorising about it, um, Treadwell and colleagues did some research around this and what they argue is there was a kind of, again, a, a kind of an array of factors that were bared out in the way that these riots seem to be expressed in looting. Um, and they argue that one of the things is that, you know, in our kind of postmodern um, world that there's an absence of unifying politics. So one of the things that people feel that they can actually control and actually do is um, do politics through consumption and express themselves through that. In this sense, you know, in terms of Bauman's ideas that these people are kind of disqualified consumers, they don't have the means to be able to participate in consumer culture legitimately, 
they can then express their frustration through this kind of um, looting behaviour. This also then kind of, you know, can be um, correlated into notions of competitive individualism and status frustration and the likes. Um, they also found very important here that the kind of the social ingredients that seem to lead to this are embedded unemployment, the kind of virtual impossibility of getting um, uh, jobs that actually um, cover the, the kind of um, standard of living needed to be able to kind of feed yourself and house yourself. And what that provokes is a deep sense of inertia in those kind of disqualified groups. Um, this leads to that kind of sense of habitus in a way that may um, see the possibility of a riot happening in that area increase. They also talk about how there was some expression of the enjoyment of looting, that the kind of this extreme risk behaviour can be explo exploited in kind of a carnal, is kind of, sorry, enjoyed in a carnivalesque kind of way. Um, and, you know, I must say, I think, uh, you know, looting does look like it would be a, a fair bit of fun in many ways. So here it's kind of important here that, like, consider how, um, what this means in broader terms. So um, we can re relate this to ide Baudrillard's ideas of fatal strategies and um, Mark Fisher's ideas of capitalist realism. Um, I'm just going to kind of mention them that if you're interested, in, you should check those out. Um, but I think... You know, this this is this shop shop now is one way of thinking about this, and gives us a kind of way of thinking about maybe how this dissatisfaction and dissent is expressed. But I think to render it as a specific kind of consumer act um, may kind of depoliticize it a bit, and kind of in some ways speak into the kind of cultural dupe understanding of consumerism. That if we take a more kind of anthropological point of view and think about you know Daniel Miller's work about how the comfort of things works in particular um, I think we can think about riots as more a kind of political act than a consumerist act um, and as Akram points out you know the prolonged experience of inequality discrimination police targeting and violence and status frustration can seem to produce a habitus where the past affects the right as present um, thereby leading to coming to the surface in political grievances where these kind of things are sparked through a particular confrontational act. And so, you know, thinking here that, you know, in many ways what, what this is kind of arguing and from a sociological and sometimes a psychological sense is that people that experience discrimination, marginalisation, um, feel like they're being um, unfairly targeted by the police and often experience police brutality. This will be, you know, there in one's kind of sense of well-being, the way that they think and feel and act in the world, like in terms of what a habitus is. And when the right kind of um, social ingredients come together, it increases the likelihood of these kind of flashpoints of riots happening. Another paper kind of critically engages with the idea of the shopocalypse here, that you know, like while it kind of um, may give us aspects of understanding of what this kind of consumer stuff means, um, Newburn and colleagues argue that it's important not to overstate the extent to which they're about that's um, about consumerism. That they're you know more about this civil disorder order seems to be more about status frustration, um, and that there's a kind of political character of the violence involved. Um, by focusing on consumption itself, it simplifies the nature of the looting by underestimating the political and ex um, expressive characteristics of what that practice may actually mean and what that, um, what the politics of alienation and exploitation is being displayed through those specific acts. Okay, so here I wanted to kind of bring a kind of social and political analysis to what um, riots may mean. In the next section, I'm gonna talk um, about some other perspectives to think about what's going on here.